I've been doing some further experimenting with the 6502 interface with the Raspberry Pi 3. I've made some changes to the Python software. I've written a second assembly language program for testing. And I've made a couple of minor changes here on the breadboard. The uh, reset circuit now has an indicator LED. And I've added a resistor here in case the pin on the Raspberry Pi is driven high and the reset button gets pushed which would short directly to ground. So if we look at this reset circuit we have the LED hooked to the positive power rail going through a resistor, current limiting resistor and then coming over here to one side of the switch and also hooked up to the reset pin on the 6502. Without the reset button being pushed, you currently see two volts here on the pin, enough to pull it up high and keep it from resetting. We can also monitor the status of the switch on this side through this resistor to the Raspberry Pi or if we push the switch we get a reset because we've connected the other side of the switch to ground so we'll see zero at the Raspberry Pi and the reset pin, the active low reset pin will be pulled low commencing a, a reset. We'll test that reset button on the breadboard Go ahead and pull up our window. We can go ahead and let the clock run. Move this a little bit higher up. As you can see, the program's executing. We can run the clock a little bit faster. And if we push the reset button, we'll just want to make sure we hold it for at least one clock cycle and you'll be able to see the reset pin status over here go to zero. There it goes. We held it for a few. And then it's going through its reset sequence and the... Let's pause right there. After our reset, we see it went through its seven step reset sequence and then we've got our reset vector here at 208 and then we started executing the program again. So what's changed in the Python software? I've added a clock count. I've added a indication of the sp speed at which the clock is running. And I've added a couple of variables uh, reset status and reset latch to help track when the reset button's been pushed, especially when the clock's been paused or single, you know, in a single step mode. I've also divided up the initial memory list that was 65K into two memory lists. One as a ROM and one used as RAM. The ROM is basically filled with no op instructions and the only thing loaded in there is the reset vector the address at which the program will start to run but at least then it, it gives a, an indication that the 6502 using the A15 bit can address a separate ROM in the upper 32K from the RAM in the lower 32K. In this section here, if the A15 is set and the read-write bit is set to a 1, that means we want to read from ROM. Down here, the A15 bit is not set, but yet the read-write bit is set, so that means we want to read data from the, from the RAM list. Then again down here, A15 is set, but in this case, 
the read write bit is zero, meaning we want to write so that way we write to the ROM list. And here the read write bit is set to zero, but the A15 bit is not set, so we want to write to the RAM list. Here at the clean up and quit section of the program, when we're looking to exit, I've got some print statements here that will indicate the values in the ROM and the RAM lists. The ROM isn't very exciting, it's mostly just no op instructions. The only thing that really shows up is the reset vector address. The RAM is a little bit more interesting, but either way it proves that you know with using that A15 bit we can either access the higher 32k ROM list or the lower 32k RAM list as far as the 6502 is concerned. We also have some print statements here that will print out some information while testing the stack and the stack pointer. So let's take a look at the assembly program that's been put into the RAM list. We'll start out at hex 208. And we're here we're going to transfer the stack pointer to the X register and then store the X register in memory. That way later we can print that memory location which is a position in the RAM list. We can print that out and figure out where the stack pointer was pointing to. Here we're looking to push the processor status onto the stack. This is the byte that will have the individual bits, whether there's a negative or a zero or a carry. All of that will be indicated by the processor status. And then we're going to transfer, once we push that status onto the stack, we're going to take another look at the at the stack pointer by transferring it to the X register and then storing that in memory. Then we're going to follow that by pulling from the top of the stack into the accumulator. We'll then store the accumulator in memory so we can take a look at that. And then again we will transfer the stack pointer and store the store it in memory. Um, that way we can just we can just get a feel for when we push something on the stack, pull something from the stack, uh, what's really going on. Just to just to test it out. And then here at the bottom, this is just to keep us from running away in memory here. We follow with a no op instruction and then a jump instruction that jumps back up to that no op and it and it loops forever there or until we quit. So let's try running the, the software and see what we get here. First of all, pull the window up into view a little bit here. And then you, as, as before in the previous video, you know, we, we start and we're in the paused state where we can single step. And here you can see the start of the reset sequence for the 6502. You can see where we have a, a rate, which really doesn't do us too much good right here while we're single stepping. But um, if we were to unpause the clock, you can see it will go through the reset sequence. And we can pause it again. And it will give us the count as it went through each step. We single step a couple more times. You see our reset vector at, at uh, you know, looking at hex 208. Remember it's little endian, so the 08 comes first and then the 02. And then we step into the program with that first instruction, which is going to transfer the stack pointer to the X register. Now if we quit right here before we execute too far, you can see the two lists 
that I've printed out. The ROM, again, being mostly filled with no op instructions, EA, um, except for the reset vector at 208. Um, on the other side, the RAM is more, more interesting. The, um, the difference between the columns is they're looking at the same index or position in the list, uh, the ROM list being on the left and the RAM list being on the right column. And then, uh, so the first two locations in RAM are, are just EA. There's no ops. We didn't write anything there. Um, that was at the same position that the ROM list had the reset vector. The uh, next group is the software, the, the assembly instructions. Um, that you can see listed out in RAM. And then down below, down in here, we've got um, you know some some information about the, the stack pointer. Uh, we, we didn't execute far enough to transfer or store the stack pointer in you know the RAM list or in memory, so they're they're still filled with no op instructions. And then looking at those stack locations, there again too, there was nothing written there, so it's all EA, no op instructions or no op value. Um, here you can see their hex with the equivalent decimal value. Here. Um, this is where the actual processor status will be so we could so we can you know look at each bit instead of putting this out or printing this out in decimal we'll printed it out you know in the binary form um, and we can take a look at that in a second let's rerun and let it do a little bit more than it did the first time so here again I can push P to let the clock just run and I can increase the rate at which it's running and I can pause and here we can take a look the the first you know seven cycles here you know the reset sequence followed by the reset vector and then jumping into the software at 208 for the assembly code or instructions here at 208 and you can see how it starts to execute and here where we're storing the X register in memory you can see the address is given at 310 and so next line down the read write bit or the read write pin is set to zero for writing and it's writing to address 310 and the data that it's writing is F8. So because it's writing F8 we can say okay then we've transferred the stack pointer to the X register we've written or stored the X register in memory which it's writing the, the value F8 but what you have to remember is that is the the low byte or the lowest eight bits of the stack pointer because the stack pointer is written to page one. If we let the program continue to run and we can slow it down we're getting near the end where we start to uh, loop And there we go. We're, you know, we've we've been we've been looping here now. We're at the end of the program, so we can quit, and then it'll print out some information for us. So here again, there's our reset vector in RAM. Here's our instructions in in RAM and the RAM address or RAM list. And here we can see that stack pointer 
at least we can see the lowest eight bits or the, the low byte reading F8 or decimal 248 and then once we've pushed the processor status onto the stack and have it read the, the next stack pointer you can see it it saved an F7 or 247 there. There again you have to remember that the stack really exists at 1F8, 1F7, but we're only given the um, lowest 8 bits. Here's our, our um, processor status that got pushed onto the stack, a value of B4. You can see the, the bits in binary format. And then also you've calculated a, a stack location uh, one of that F8, those lower eight bits, with the high byte of one set. So that would give us the true position in the RAM where the stack is, is located. And if we look in there, it, we do have that value of B4 um, at that location of 1F8. And then our, our second location that we, we've seen um, after pushing the processor status onto the stack of 1F7, nothing was pushed to the stack at that location, so it's reading EA, the, you know, our default no-op instruction that we set up initially.